Hi there, this is Jude Socrates. Welcome to video number 38 for my series in multivariable calculus known as Math 5C at Pasadena City College. So uh, today we're going to finish with chapter six. Um, you might think, wow, uh, just four sections, kind of short chapter, but it's actually a very important chapter. So uh, we have been generalizing um, basically the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, first in the form of Green's theorem, and then we talked about divergence and curl. And then in our last video, we talked about the divergence theorem, which is sort of a generalization of Green's theorem. And today we're going to talk about another generalization of Green's theorem, this time involving a different kind of surface. So I will see you in a minute on page 341. All right, so this is called Stokes' theorem. Now, in order to understand uh, what it says, we're going to first have to understand the kind of surface that it involves, okay? And that is a surface with boundary, okay? So uh, what does that mean? Well, when you have a plain figure, like, you know, a triangle or a rectangle or a parallelogram, so it's on the xy plane, let's say, uh, we, we can see right away, okay, so there are three edges that make up the boundary of this triangle. All right, here you're inside the triangle, and now you are outside the triangle, okay? So uh, if this is floating in space, then yeah, you can still um, perceive, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the three edges that make up this triangle, okay? And you can sense, okay, that that is the boundary of the triangle, okay? So here are some examples of uh, plain geometric figures that have a clear boundary, you know, like parallelogram, triangle, and a disk, okay? So of course the uh, boundary of the disk is a circle. Okay, so what are some examples of surfaces that do not have a boundary, okay? So, well, a uh, sphere, Okay, um, whoops, sorry, <laughs> a, uh, a cube, okay, or a box does not have a boundary. There are edges, okay, but there is no boundary, okay. Uh, a torus, a donut, okay, that does not have a boundary either, okay. Uh, it turns out that it's actually kind of difficult to mathematically describe what a boundary is supposed to be. Okay, so we're going to make a little bit of an attempt at that. Okay, so yeah, even though a cube or a box has edges, those are not boundaries, okay? So one way to think about it is that if you are an ant walking on the sphere or the box or the torus, you're not going to fall off if you keep walking, okay? Assuming you can walk upside down and, you know, ants can do that, okay? So can spiders, Spider-Man. Uh, here, uh, yeah, if you were an ant on this triangle, you keep walking, you will fall off the triangle, okay? So in our last video, we talked about the divergence theorem, and yeah, we encountered um, solids, and we related the surface integral through the surface of that solid to a triple integral on the solid, okay? So those solids, uh, those surfaces that we saw that make up the boundary of this, this solid, they are examples of surfaces that do not have a boundary. Okay, so there it is. They do not have a boundary. Again, even though the snow globe has an edge and the tetrahedron has one, two, three, four, five, six edges, those are not boundaries. Okay, so an ant can keep walking, keep going around, um, the surfaces of a tetrahedron without falling off. All right, but if you go back to the sphere or even the box or the, the torus, um, we could cut out a portion of that surface and then suddenly, suddenly, there's a boundary, okay? So here's a hemisphere, okay? And this circle, this longitudinal circle is the boundary of this hemisphere. Okay, this is worse, okay? We have portion of the sphere in the first octet, okay? And now it looks like uh, the boundary is made of three arcs. Hmm, 
Okay, here we have Captain America's shield. Let's say uh, we lop off a portion of the front of the sphere. And again, you're going to have a circle as the boundary of that surface. All right, so here's an attempt to define the boundary of a surface with boundary. Um, if you are at this point on the surface, then you can enclose that point inside a disk, and that disk will be entirely inside the surface. Okay, so that is called an interior point. Okay, but uh, here you are on the edge of this rectangle, and you can try to make a disk as small as possible as you can surrounding a point on that edge. And there will always be parts of that disk which are not on the surface. Okay, so in other words, part of it will be inside, part of it will be outside the surface, off the surface. Okay, so that point P on the edge, that is a boundary point. Okay, so similarly for that uh, piece of the sphere in the first octant, okay, I just took the topmost point. That's the easiest one to draw a disk on. Now, the, the sphere is not flat, okay? I'm not gonna give you, I'm, I'm not going to deny that, okay? But we can approximate a little disk here, which is almost flat, okay? We can make it a little bit curved. And then, once again, no matter how small you make that disk, part of it will be inside your surface, part of it will be outside okay so that topmost point that is part of the boundary and of course you can walk anywhere here and the situation will be similar to this edge over here okay uh, even if you're here any circle centered around a point on this left edge will be partly inside partly outside same thing here any circle centered on a point on this edge will be partly inside and partly outside of that surface. All right, so in a minute we're going to talk about um, orientation on the boundary curve of a surface with boundary as it applies to Stokes' theorem. Okay, but let's review what we did for Green's theorem. Right, so we said that if you have a region on the plane, the boundary is oriented in a positive way you have a positive orientation for the boundary, if more or less you're going around in a counterclockwise way. Okay, so this triangle is on the xy plane, and if you walk along it somewhat in a counterclockwise way, that is the positive orientation. Okay, so we also said if this triangle were on the floor, and we think of it as a swimming pool, then we would be walking along the boundary in a positive orientation, if our left hand is towards the swimming pool as we walk around it, okay? So I have here uh, Madame Maleficent who will walk around our swimming pool. So her left hand is over there. So as she walks around the swimming pool, okay, her left hand is towards the, swim, the swimming pool, okay? So that is the positive orientation for that region according to Green's theorem. Okay, so orienting a curve on the xy plane is not a big deal because there's really just one way that we look at the xy plane. It's like a blackboard or a whiteboard and we, it's in front of us, okay? And x positive x is to the right, positive y is going up, okay? So we have a natural orientation for the xy plane, okay? Unfortunately, if you have a triangle floating in space now, there are lots and lots of ways to look at it, okay? So for example, if we are on the uh, XZ plane, then normally we would take a side view from the negative Y axis, okay? But what's wrong with looking at it from the positive Y axis, okay? why would one point of view be more legitimate than the opposite point of view from the opposite direction, okay? So yeah, the, the trouble with working 
with a figure in space is that there are now lots and lots of ways to look at it. Okay, mm -hmm. remember when we were doing triple integrals, we put together the front view, side view, top view, all of those views were important. Okay, so now that we have a surface uh, in space, okay, so uh, here's just a slightly bulgy surface. Yeah, it's the uh, container for my headphones. Okay, so it's kind of like part of a sphere, okay, the top part of a sphere, except maybe it's more elliptical. Okay, when we did flux integrals, so remember we talked about orientable surfaces. Okay, so at every point on the surface, there is a continuous unit normal vector. Okay, so for a sphere, we said uh, we could choose the outward unit normal vectors or we can choose the inward normal vectors. And that appeared in the divergence theorem uh, in our last video. Okay, so we're going to bring back Maleficent, right? If this is our surface, okay, then the boundary will be this el ellipse-like curve going around the base, okay? And again, it's like a swimming pool, okay, except now it's just slightly bulged, okay? So once again, your curve, your boundary curve is going to be positively oriented if when you walk around the edge of the surface, the boundary of the surface, with your head pointing towards the unit normal vector, okay, so in this case, upwards, then your left hand should again be pointing towards the surface, okay? So that's how we should think about it, right? It's almost like Green's theorem, except now the swimming pool can be bulgy, all right, for lack of a better word. Okay, but if we want the boundary to be oriented in a positive way, when you walk around the boundary with your head pointing towards the out the the, the, the normal vector, the unit normal vector, which you are given, your left hand should be pointing towards the swimming pool. Okay, so we call that the induced positive orientation on the boundary curve. Okay, our given orientation, n of x, y, z, will determine a positive orientation on the boundary curve. Okay, so to prepare ourselves to state uh, Stokes' theorem, which is down here, we are going to rewrite Green's theorem one more time. We will have a fourth version. You already saw bits and pieces of it, okay? So suppose that D is a closed and bounded region on the xy plane, which is either a type 1 or a type 2 domain, or a finite union of such domains without holes. Okay, sounds familiar? That's just how we started it out in the third version. Let C be the boundary curve of D, given the positive orientation. Okay, so again, more or less in a counterclockwise manner. Suppose that F, uh, F of xy, which is PQ, uh, where P and Q have continuous partial derivatives on an open region on the xy plane that contains the curve C and the interior D, then the contour integral around C, again in the positive orientation of F dot dr, is the double integral over the domain of the curl of F dotted with the, the normal vector K dA. Right, so this is slightly artificial because F only has two components, okay? But we can create a third component just by putting zero there, okay? And even though you put a Z there, none of the components will depend on Z, okay? So you can take the curl off that vector field, but we only want the Z component. Okay, so remember in the z component of the curl, you have your qx minus py, okay? And that is what appears in the double integral in the conclusion of Green's theorem, okay? So now let's take a look at Stokes' theorem and yeah, check it out. If you kind of squint and look at these three equations 
aren't they, uh, the two equations, aren't they exactly the same just about here? Uh, no, not quite. Um, yeah, that says boundary of D, this says boundary of S, double integral over D, double integral over S, but most importantly, there is no dot K down here. There is a DS though, okay, because that's a symbol that we use for a flux integral. Okay, so let me get out of the way here. So, <clears throat> Stokes' theorem. So, by the way, uh, Sir George Gabriel Stokes uh, was the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge. Okay, and if you know uh, the famous Stephen Hawking, um, Brief uh, History of the Universe, uh, that was the same professorial chair that he occupied. Okay, so Stokes' theorem says, <clears throat> Suppose that S is an oriented piecewise smooth surface with boundary curve C, which is the boundary of S, which is a simple closed piecewise smooth curve. Okay, let n of x, y, z be a fixed orientation of S. Okay, so you have to be told which orientation do you want for S. Okay, let C be given the induced positive orientation from n of x, y, z. As we said earlier, okay, as you walk around the swimming pool, your left hand should be pointing towards the swimming pool, while your head is pointing towards the unit normal vectors. Okay, so this time F is a full-fledged uh, vector field in three variables, and there are of course three components to our vector field, P, Q, and R. Okay, and those components have continuous partial derivatives on an open region in three-dimensional space containing our surfaces. Okay, then the contour integral around C of f dot dr is the double integral over S of the curl of f dot ds. Okay, here's our example. We will use Stokes' theorem to find the contra-integral over the vector field, this over here, along the curve made of three-quarter circles, all of them centered at the origin. Hmm, the first quarter cir circle is from 0, 0, 002 to 200 0, 0 on the x-axis, going clockwise as seen from the left side. Hmm, okay, so from the side view, it's going clockwise. Okay, but from that point two zero zero, you want to go to zero two zero. This time going in a counterclockwise way, as seen from above. Okay, so I'm deliberately giving you example an example where we have clockwise and counterclockwise in the same curve. But again, depending on your point of view. Okay. And finally, we want the quarter circle from this point, 0 to 0, back to 0, 0, 2. And this time, we want it to be counterclockwise also, as seen from the front. Okay. So by the way, in case you haven't noticed, I'm standing up. I finally bought myself a standing desk. So um, how do we do this? Okay. So Stokes' theorem says that the contour integral of this field along these three quarter circles is the same as the flux integral over the surface. What surface? We're not given a surface. We need a surface whose boundary is the, are these three quarter circles in that order. Okay. And we are going to use that surface to find the flux of the curl of this vector field, okay? So, you know, while we're still here, why don't we do that, okay? Let's find the curl of this vector field, okay? So let's copy that down here. And I changed my mind on that problem, so I'm just gonna hide that. You never saw it. So we have this vector field, and we're going to find the curl, okay? So uh, remember how to do that. Okay, so we'll need a three by three determinant. And we have I, J, and K. And we have a partial 
uh, x in the first column and then partial y and then partial z. Okay, and then we have these uh, three components. So I believe I can paste that down here. Let's see if it works. Oh, it works. Yeah, than before. Okay, so we are going to get uh, another vector field. Okay, so let's put our answer on the right side. One by three. Okay, so for the first component, we'll have partial y of this. Okay. So I see one Y, and so we're going to get nine Z, okay? But subtract partial Z of this, okay? So minus, what are we, so partial Z, oh, minus three X, and that disappears. So minus three X. Okay, so it's gonna be plus three X. Okay, now for J, we have partial Z of this, ooh. There is no z there. <gasps> so that's a zero. And then minus partial x of this. I see only one x there, so minus eight. Excellent. Next, for k, we want partial x of this. I see one x there, so that's minus three z. And then we will subtract, whoops, uh, this one. We will subtract partial y of this. So we have 12y. Okay, so that's about it. So I guess I don't need those parentheses after all. So that is the uh, curl. Okay, any chance I got it right? Compute vector calculus curl. Uh, 3x plus 9z. Thank you. Negative 8. Thank you. Negative 3z minus 12y. Yes, I got something right for a change. Okay, so this is what we are going to integrate. We will find the flux of this curl through a surface, which we haven't found yet, that bounds these three curves, these three quarter circles. You already know what it is, because, uh, hint, we did see it a couple of pages ago. All right, so let's draw those quarter circles, okay? So uh, we're going to use a curve, so x, y, z. Quarter circles, so maybe we'll make t go from 0 to pi over 2, okay? Standard domain for a quarter circle. Only problem is, okay, we're going to start at 0, 0, 2 and go clockwise to 2, 0, 0. Okay, so we are on the x z plane so y is going to be zero so yeah normally we would start um at two zero zero and go counterclockwise to zero zero two so hopefully you remember how to do your little tricks so i believe if we do two cosine t over here and two sine t over here any chance will be correct? Ooh, there it is. Aha! So there is our positive x-axis. Let me go back to rotate. There you go. So from 0, 0, 2 to 2, 0, 0. Okay? So now we are going to go from 2, 0, 0 counterclockwise to 0, 2, 0. Okay, so that one is our standard quarter circle. So we'll duplicate input. So we will have two cosine t and two sine t. So uh, can I erase this? Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't want you to erase something, to delete something. There's our two sine t. Yeah, there you go. And uh, the z coordinate is zero. There you are. Okay. So that is our second quarter circle. And now we complete it with a third quarter circle from 0, 0, 2. I'm sorry, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 2. So, um, yeah, you know, I will type it over. So this time x is 0, and it's y versus z. So y will be 2 cosine t, z will be 2 sine t. 
and p will go from 0 to pi over pi over to there it is. Okay, so that is supposed to be the boundary of our surface. So do you recognize it now? Yes, we saw it uh, in one of our pages earlier. The surface that will do the job for us will be one eighth of the sphere uh, centered at the origin, and it looks like the radius of that sphere is supposed to be two. Okay, so we are now experts in how to parametrize such a sphere, such a portion of the sphere. Okay, let's get back to work. Oops, I forgot something. Orientation. Okay. We're not told about the orientation of the sphere because we're not told about the sphere. All we were told about are the three-quarter circles okay, and how we're supposed to walk around it. Okay, So you need a little bit of your imagination now. We're going to start at the top. We're going to go down to 200 clockwise as seen from the left. So clockwise as seen from the left okay and then we're going to go counterclockwise from 200 to 020 and then counterclockwise again from 020 whoo back to 002 out for a spin so which way should our head be pointing so that our left hand is on this surface okay so it looks like and and we're walking Okay, so this time we're told you have to walk this way and this way and this way. We have no choice. Okay, this is the direction in which we are being told to walk. So if we walk that way and you want your left hand on the surface, then your head should be pointing outwards, okay, away from the origin. Okay, so uh, in short, we have to give the sphere the outward unit normal vectors. All right, so since uh, the curve C must be uh, traversed uh, using a positive induced orientation from the normal vectors, uh, the unit normal vectors of the sphere, okay, so a sphere of radius 2 centered at the origin, our head must be pointing away from the origin so that our left hand is towards the one eighth of a sphere. Okay. So that is the surface that we are going to use to compute the flux integral, okay? So go away. So we know, of course, how to create a parametrization for that surface, okay? So we will have our R of uh, phi theta. Uh, the radius is two, so we will have two um, sine phi and cosine theta, and then we will have two sine phi, <clears throat> sine theta, and then we will have two cosine of phi, okay? So that will be what we plug into our curl, okay? So we will have this plug into that. So we have 9z plus 3x and negative 8 constant and that. Okay, so I see z's. So it looks like we're going to get 18 cosine phi. And there's another z here, so minus 6. Minus 6 cosine phi. Yeah. Okay, 3x, so this is our x, 3 times 2 is 6. Okay, and just a constant there, minus 12y. So y is this, 
So it looks like it's going to be minus 24 of that. Okay, excellent. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we're going to need the cross product, right? So, um, yeah, one more time, okay? So we will do our phi, which is, so with respect to phi, you have cosine phi over here and cosine phi over here and minus sine phi over here. Okay, and then with respect to theta. Okay, so now for theta, cosine becomes negative sine. <laughs> sine becomes cosine. Phi disappears, yay, because it is a constant with respect to theta. Okay, so we will take the cross product. I'm going to put our answer not in there, silly you. So the cross will be down here. And um, remember, after we take the cross, we have to make sure that it follows the orientation that we want, which is with our uh, head pointing away from the origin. Okay? So, <clears throat> Uh, cross product, 0 plus 4, 4 sine squared phi cosine theta. 4 sine squared phi cosine theta. We've done this before, right? Okay, and then for y, 4 sine squared phi sine theta. Ooh, how convenient. 4 sine squared phi sine theta. And then, yeah, because the other one is zero. And then for z, four sine phi cosine phi cosine squared. So let's do four. Four cosine phi sine phi. And then we will have uh, <clears throat> out here. And then cosine squared theta and then minus minus plus four cosine phi sine phi sine squared. So that's going to be one. Okay. So uh, this is our cross product. Are we pointing outwards? Okay. So uh, yeah, let's plug in phi equals zero and theta. Yeah. Oh, by the way, yeah, what's our domain? Uh, that one eighth of a sphere. So phi will go from zero to pi over two. Theta will also go from zero to pi over two. Okay, so let's, uh, at the top, let's do um, both zeros. Okay, so um, sine phi will be zero, zero, cosine phi, um, uh, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, remember, uh, the sphere is not smooth at the top, so we have to move just a little bit away from it, okay? So if, if phi is a small number uh, close to zero, then um, that will be positive, uh, that will be positive. Yeah, theta also, we can make it small number close to zero, and both of those are positive, that's going to be positive, okay? So that is the upward um, unit, uh, upward normal vector. Okay, so it's not a unit vector. Okay, but it is the correct orientation. So remember that uh, when we do the ds, okay, the, the area will cancel out. Okay, so this cross product is exactly what we need to perform the integration. Okay, so uh, that integral, yeah, it will still be kind of painful, but it's better than doing three contour integrals, okay? Three contour integrals of this disgusting looking vector field, okay? I mean, do you really want to do that, okay? We saw the parametrization of the three curves, okay? Sure, they're not that difficult, and one coordinate is zero for every piece of that curve, okay? But do you really want to do three contour integrals? Maybe, 
maybe not. Okay, so uh, we will of course um, find the surface integral of the dot product of these two. Okay, so we said that phi will go from zero to pi over two. Okay, so we have a d phi on the outside, and then on the inside we'll have our d theta. Integral also from zero to pi over two. Okay, so we're going to take the take the dot product of these two vectors. Okay, and if you were doing this, you know, by hand, uh, yeah, you would probably want to take the four. Okay, so um, so uh, the contour integral uh, that we want by Stokes' theorem is exactly the same as the flux integral. Okay, so let me scroll down here. So there will be a four. And then we have to take the dot product of those two vectors. Uh, there we go. Let me prep it. So we're going to multiply three pairs together and two and one more, uh, three. Okay, there you go. So yeah, there will still be some badness. I'm not going to lie to you. There will still be some work to be done. Okay. So we have this. And then multiplied by this. Okay. And then we have this. <clears throat> and then multiplied by negative eight. Okay, and then we have third one multiplied by this. Oh, it almost fit. Okay, so yeah, uh, that's just the d theta d phi over there. Okay, um, so yeah, there will still be some pain involved, right? You will see a sine squared cosine oh that's not so bad that's just a u sub um you will see a cosine squared there uh you'll see a sine cubed um you know what to do change the sine squared to one minus cosine squared then do a u sub um sine squared you know what to do cosine squared you know what to do cosine sine so yeah there is still some pain involved okay but um i think it's still better than three contour integrals do we have an answer? So let's see. Thinking, thinking. Oh, there we go. So it is a negative flux. Minus 32 pi minus 32. All right. Great. So that is Stokes' theorem. I hope you're stoked about it. Ha, 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 ha. So uh, yes, that is the end of our chapter 6. And when we come back, we are going to do, uh, we're going to go back to space curves. Okay? And we're going to uh, literally look more closely at it because we are going to look at the differential structure of space curves. Alrighty. So until then, I hope you enjoyed our video for today. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.